session of the day. Uh, a, little, a little pressure on Ryan, Ryan Hayes, he's with the TVG security. Yep. Uh, a little pressure on him. Uh, he wants to speak down. We get up to the, uh, to the closing and that. And then, um, <laughs> okay, anyway. So, uh, Ryan's going to talk, tell, talk to us a little bit about weaponizing Splunk. Yeah, so they want, to, they want me to by 525. This is an hour long presentation, so I'm going to glance over a few things. Um, hopefully we get at least the good stuff. Um, so this is me, I'm Ryan, um, Director of Security Engineering at TBG, which basically just means I hack stuff and I have to manage stuff at the same time. Um, what not. So where did this talk come from? Um, last year we were on a pen testing engagement. Uh, we had internal access popped a couple boxes, but we weren't really getting anywhere. We noticed that, hey, they got Splunk. Let's go look at it. So you navigate to the web page, and it automatically logged me in as admin. It's like, that's awesome. But what can I do from there, right? So we, we, we looked at the data. We, 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 we got some new usernames. We got some machines and whatnot. But uh, from there, how was I really going to leverage that into, into an attack? So um, we were able to build a custom app. We can install it. We get OS access that way. And I'll start talking about that later. But then we were also able to install other apps that would make us, that would allow us to laterally move throughout the network and basically own everything. So it's kind of awesome. So what am I here for? Um, I'm going to kind of talk about Splunk, but I'm going to breeze over a lot of that because I hope most of you guys in here know at least what Splunk is. Um, the basic stuff about with misconfigurations that we see during our engagements, it's probably the same stuff that everybody else is seeing. Um, and then really into, into what, we're what we're here for. Um, so, when, we talk, when I talk about weaponizing Splunk, there's really three areas. We're attacking the, the server that the application is installed on. We're attacking the organization. We're moving laterally. And then I kind of started putting together a little bit of, of stuff where you could actually utilize Splunk as almost a C2. So you wouldn't really be using a customer or organization Splunk server. You'd be using your own. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about with attacking the data. And then, I mean, what's the use of telling you how to break things if I don't tell you how to fix it? So we'll kind of touch on some mitigating actions really quickly. So what is Splunk? Log aggregation tool. You can expand it using Python, PowerShell, Bash, just about any scripting language you, can, you, you have out there. Um, with the expansions, it does allow command execution, which is really cool. That's the whole reason with the, uh, the apps. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions on these slides, stop me and I can talk about them too. So the misconfigurations. The default password, now, now Splunk has changed this in the recent 6.5 release, but anything prior to this, when you installed it, the default password was change me. It now does force a password reset well, upon installation. Um, the older versions, like I talked about a minute ago, they did automatically log you in. Now that was back probably version 4, 4.5. 4, so a lot of that's been changed as well. Um, if you're not using SSL, you can do man in the middle attacks. And then Obviously, I see, we see this all the time, especially with the universal forwarders. They're running as root level access or system level access on the Windows box. So, weaponizing Splunk. Like I talked about a minute ago, you're going to be attacking the, the server itself. And when, when, you, when we attack the server, we're going to be looking at, you know, look at the logs that are already in place on there. Read over those. I mean, there's, you know, off, off logs in there. I can get usernames. Um, you might get web app logs in there. I, now I know what, what web apps are out there, what, um, what configurations they're in, and what OS they might be running. <coughs> Local file access. If Splunk's running as a root user or a system user, I now, I now have read access to every file on there, and there's no sort of logging in place there. And then malicious applications. Um, that was what I talked about a minute ago, where you can install an app, and we can actually own the entire server. So when we look at attacking the organization, I want to I want to look at not only that Splunk server but every other box out there because all these universal forwarders are going to be deployed out and they're going to be sending in logs or running applications that I write and send out to them. And then finally, the attacking the data stuff like I talked about, just bringing in all of our pen testing logs. <clears throat> so reviewing reviewing the logs, stuff that's already there, auth logs like I talked about for usernames, um, system logs. You know, Windows, Windows system logs, application logs. I'll know what servers are out there, what the function of those servers are. Um, I can get login uh, information from you know Linux and Windows boxes both. So now I can I can profile my target and say, hey, they have eight to five working hours, or they have a rotating shift where everybody's working all day long. Um, all all that thing can be profiled out. 
Here's all the things I just talked about. Here's some file, or yeah, here's some files that I would actually go to look for. You know, Etsy, Etsy Shadow. Now I have all your hash, password hashes on the boxes. <coughs> um, actually, yep, I have a demo of this one. So let's see here. So when we want to look at local files, you can add data and I can, I can monitor it. As long as I don't hit next all the way to finish, there's no log. None of this data is actually getting ingested by Splunk, but I can read it. So this would be a common misconfiguration that I see constantly is Splunk is you know, running as a root user or running a system, and I can now read in every, all, the, all the passwords on a box. Or I could read in the host name or uh, Etsy host file to see what other boxes I communicate with. Any, any, any file really on the system there. And as I said, as long as you don't keep hitting next and go to, go to done, stay right here. None of this information is logged. It's not brought in. No one has any idea we were ever here. So malicious applications. Splunk, um, something I didn't talk about a second ago because I'm just trying to go through it real quick. Uh, Splunk allows applications to be installed. Usually those applications are helpful in parsing other data sets that you might be bringing in. But as I said, it's expandable with uh, scripting. So you, if you want to write a Python shell, a bind or reverse shell, or you want to write some other code that you want to run on the box, you can install that on Splunk. So here's a quick demo of this one. So from, uh, from your, your attacking machine, you'd ru you, I'm running Metasploit, but I mean, you really could do this any, any way you wanted. <laughs> So we'll start up our handler. We'll give it all the options for the IPs and ports. I'm have a watch. There it is. Come on. Doesn't allow me to. Guess we'll go with it. OK, so we have a handler running. We're good to go. So now let's go back to Splunk. Come on, catch up. All right, so here we're going to log in. Now hopefully through some sort of misconfiguration, you have this credential to log into Splunk, or it automatically logs you in, one or the other. We can go up top here to the configurations for the apps. We can install this from a file because we've already downloaded it. All of this stuff will be, is on GitHub and the link's at the end. So we'll install our app from file. Now there's one setting on the newest version of Splunk, um, the 6.5 release, anything past 6.5. You do have to set the permissions here because you can't set it within the configuration files. At least I don't know how, if you can. So we'll set that and we'll save it. And so what this does is this installs commands that you can run from the search and reporting app. So now we have it installed. We'll go over to the search and reporting. And you now have new, new commands that you can run. With this one, I only have a reverse and a bind shell. But literally, it could be expanded any way you want. So we'll run a reverse shell. Since we started a interpreter handler, we're going to do a interpreter shell. And we're going to give it the IP to communicate to and the port. And then we just hit Enter. So when this, this will spin off a shell, it forks it off so that it's not sitting and running and, and consuming all your resources on your Splunk server. And also, if anybody catches on and shuts down Splunk or, sh or logs you out, the shell's still going to still live on. So now we're logged in. We have access, whatever they, they give us. And obviously, I can't type very well, but there. So there we go. There's that. So as I said, everything's available on GitHub. Um, it really was in, it, available on the Splunk base for a little while, about 54 minutes. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Yeah, so I submitted, submitted it to, to Splunk. And I mean, the, the app is technically not malicious. I mean, you could be using it any way you wanted to if you really wanted to install it. Um, so yeah, I, it got approved. It was awesome. We all danced. I thought it was great. It would have made it a lot easier by downloading this and uploading it to the Splunk server and installing it. You literally could look for it inside Splunk and just hit install and be good to go. But then, 
Yeah. <laughs> About fifty. I was like fifty-four, fifty-six minutes later, I got a rejection email, and I'm sure somebody got their hand slapped. It was quite entertaining. Um, so we could extract data from Splunk as well. So Splunk has a full, fully featured API. The whole web interface is all based on the API as well. Um, all the configuration files in Splunk, they have passwords of some sort. If you install a Windows app, for instance, and you want to talk to the domain controller, you have to have a user account to talk to the domain controller. So you'd want to save all that stuff. Um, Splunk does do its best, and it does encrypt all the passwords, which is great. And it does, uh, it does use a salt when it encrypts them as well. And that salt is unique to each implementation, so you can't copy it over. So here's just a demo, or a, not a demo, but a screenshot of what you would see. For instance, with the Windows app, you would install, fill out all your information, and down there at the bottom, you'd have to give it a user, um, at least read-only access of, of some user. Nine times out of 10, you usually find that they're higher leveled. And so that's what that password would look like in a configuration file. So it is encrypted, it is, it is salted, so you can't really decode it. But with about 14 lines of Python, I can. So using the Splunk API and those admin credentials that we're already logging in with, we can run this. And now down here at the bottom, it loops through every app and every configuration that's available there. And we do get clear text passwords, which is really awesome. <laughs> so. Now that we've attacked the server, we have our fo foothold on the server. Um, we're good to go there. Let's start attacking everybody else in the network. So as, as, I, as I said earlier, Splunk's based off of a, a or Splunk has universal forwarder apps that go out to every machine that you want to collect logs to, which usually at least is some high-level machines, Windows and Linux machines in your, in your uh, network. Um, these universal forwarders do allow you to run scripts and apps and command execution as well. So it's really cool. Um, they're all based on a deployment server, and I have some screenshots of that. So here's what a deployment server would look like. You have clients that check in. They check in on whatever interval you set, usually you know, 5 to 30 seconds to a minute, whatever it is. Um, they split up all your apps, or all your apps and all your hosts are split up based on classes. These classes can be set up based on host names, based on operating systems to make sure that you install you know, only Windows apps on the Windows boxes and you don't fill up everybody's space. And then uh, all your apps, of course. So with the app that we just installed earlier, the Shells app, um, there are two technology add-ons that I have. And those need to be fixed. So I'll make a note of that. Um, there are two technology add-ons for Windows boxes and Linux boxes that will allow you to, once I deploy out the application, it runs those reverse through the bind shells again. And they all call home. So in a matter of seconds, I could literally pop 60 to 80 boxes or however many are really in there or Metasploit crashes one or the other. So the Windows one is based on, it's a bat file basically that runs. It's all based on PowerShell. I use uh, Unicorn to generate the PowerShell, or Interpreter PowerShell uh, payloads. Um, but again, you could put whatever the heck you wanted in there, and that would run. The uh, Linux shell is based on the same, actually it's really the same shell that I was running on the other app. It's Python based. It's, again, it's just Metasploit. It's all basic stuff but they could all be swapped out with whatever code you wanted. So here's that demo. And I videotaped these because last time I did a live demo, it all broke. So as I said, for the, uh, for the Windows one, I used the Unicorn tool. Um, Dave, if he's still here, he's the one that wrote it. So this just generates an output of a PowerShell script that you can run on any host, and it basically phones home, gives you an interpreter show on the box. So that's what that looks like. So we're just going to copy and paste that, put that in our batch file. So the configurations that I'm editing, these are, this is on the actual attack or the victim server. So the Splunk Shells was the app we installed a minute ago. The two TAs that are right there, that's where we're going to install. We're going to move those to be deployed.
fast forward at all. Yeah, it's not fast forwarding. Oh well, sorry. So we edited that. Now we need to add the Linux app just to make sure that our, our IP and our ports are configured correctly. We're coming back to the right attacking box. <laughs> All right, so we got those set up. Now we need to just go to, oh, we need to set up our, our handler first too. Apparently it's update time. All right, so we have a handler for our Windows payload. Obviously, we need to have one for our Linux payload. Come on. Any questions so far on that while this is going? It downloads the stager. Uh, it is a staged payload with Metasploit. Okay. But no, it's not pulling anything from the internet. It would all be from your attacking machine wherever you're sitting it's not there. IEX based. It's not pulling anything using IEX and PowerShell. No? Nope. Okay. Well, it is, but it's not from the internet. Okay. Yeah. It would just yeah. It's just from from your attacking. The attacker. Yeah. All right, so I already got the apps here that we saw a second ago. We're just going to edit them to, um, we'll add the server class so that the Linux payload goes to Linux boxes, Windows goes to Windows, and vice versa. Come on. Was there another question? Yeah, going back a minute to the password. Yep. Um, you showed the encrypted password and then you showed pulling it out. You didn't decrypt it, you just found a place that Splunk had it decrypted in memory. Uh, it's not in memory, so the API actually goes through all those configuration files so that it can decrypt and use them. Okay. Um, I just basically accessed that with the API and said, hey, I'm the app, I need my clear text password, and it gives it to me. Wonderful, thank you. So here's some interpreter sessions coming back. So you can literally pop you know, 30, 40, 50 boxes. Um, and so this one's still in development. As I said, so this would be, on my attacking box, I would install Splunk. And then all these tools that we run during our pen test, Nmap, um, you know, Wi-Fi, Pineapples, any, anything that we really run, it generates a lot of data. And it takes a lot of time to go through all that data for when it comes down to reporting. And that's the part I hate about it. So if we had apps and, and installed them and, and pulled all our data into Splunk, it would make our job a lot easier. Plus, it decreases that dwell time from running an Nmap scan and having to parse through logs to find my ports. Now I have it in real time. So for here, this is the Wi-Fi Pineapple app that I have set up. In real time, I'd be getting data from the device that's out there doing its attack. I have the SSIDs, I have the clients, I know what's happening. Um, some things that I want to do in the future is I'd like to add context menus here so that I could quickly click on something and say, hey, run XYZ attack against it, and it would quickly do that for me. Um, that's still in development. And then another one that we like to use is uh, Responder. So if you haven't used Responder, it's a man-in-the-middle attack tool and grabs ha password hashes from different uh, protocols running inside of a network. So if I was running this in real time, I would have access to all the data that told me, hey, how many hashes have I captured? What are the usernames? And then down there at the bottom, everything's blurred because this is actually live data from a customer that we were, we were working with. Um, <laughs> but, so down here at the bottom, I could quickly download that, uh, that file that gave me the, the password hashes and all the information that I could feed into my password cracker. And, quickly spit, spit those back out. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I had to blur all that stuff. So it would be uh, on the top right there, you would have uh, all the clients that I was actually attacking. And then right below that would be usernames. <laughs> OK, so um, as I'm ending here, we'll just talk about mitigating actions. Obviously, it's basic. Update your software, enable encryption, change your passwords, and don't run as root. And then there's a really cool document right there at that link. And uh, they walk you through probably 20 or 30 other pages that you can do. And here's my information if anybody wants to reach out. And sorry, I know it was quick, but I only had 30 minutes.
Any other questions? <laughs>